Um, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be invited here to represent Norway and to represent Darman and Vixnes Architects. We, Darman and Vixnes Architects, we're about 20 people, uh, a big company that was established uh, some 22 years ago. We are doing some public buildings, we are, but today I'm mostly going to deal with with sort of things that are way out in the landscape. This is the Oslo School of Architecture, uh, the first sort of major competition we won some 19 years ago. When we were, we were not as young as, as uh, now, but we were fairly young. Um, we just started the office two years before. Um, um, we have done things like the Oslo International School, uh, and we have even done a Ministry of Defense uh, in Norway, uh, in Oslo. Uh, but now I'm going to talk about lost in nature. Uh, this conference deals with public space on one side and landscape on the other side. I guess um, I could say that Norwegians, we have not a clue of public space. Um, we own landscape. And, um, lost in nature is kind of um, denotes uh, condition of uh, sort of a maybe it's a, even a specific Nordic condition um, of um, uh, caused by uh, the fact that we have to deal with things like this. Um, this is in the Lofoten Islands. What is uh, significant about this picture is, uh, well, of course, nature, but the very little impact that man can do in a landscape like that. The scale of the landscape is amazing, is enormous, and uh, uh, you're not able to do much impact. Um, or like here, one of the deep valleys of Norway, um, you can get do a little more impact by by starting to farm the, the land, but the, the sort of the, 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 the rock conditions or the granite of the mountains, they're always present. Um, this is a painting by Johann Christian Dahl. Um, it's sort of, I always like to think about this. He was a professor in Dresden, uh, which meant that he, he was a close friend of Schinkel, um, and he traveled through Norway during the summers, and then he went back to Dresden, and then he painted these things here in the middle of the 19th century. Um, this is another Norwegian painter, Harald Solberg, um, which in many ways sort of, I mean, this is our cathedral, and you can even see that uh, Solberg, he painted a cross on the top of the mountain. Um, I still think that um, we were not really Christianed. We have been fortunate enough to confront this landscape. Uh, this is even a landscape very close to Oslo. This is a one-family house that you can reach by 50 minutes tram from the center of Oslo. Um, or like here on the beach on the west coast of Norway outside of Stavanger. Um, all built in white concrete to try to match the whiteness of the sand on the beach below. Or like here, um, where this theme of sort of, I mean, you, you could call it as simple as mimic nature, of to blend in to sort of be part of nature, both in terms of shape and materials, becomes an, an important theme for us. Or maybe it's not even conscious. It's the way that we react to places like this. Or like this, when we work on completely different budgets, a one family house for a very young family that came to us with a very difficult site and uh, um, with the outspoken reference that they wanted the house to look like you could shoot a James Bond movie in it. Um, the interior of that. 
Um, sometimes there's no need for very much. Uh, we have had in Norway over the last 20 years a very extensive program that has been mentioned many times today uh, of tourist routes um, to facilitate sort of uh, Norway for tourists. Uh, some of those projects, they're spectacular. Uh, they make really amazing photographs, but in some ways you can ask, is it really necessary? Uh, this is the site of one of our interventions within the Tourist Routes program. Uh, this is the site. You can see some men walking with yellow and, and orange jackets. Um, and the problem here was to facilitate, to stop and sort of telling people what to do in this spot. And this is what we did. We drew a yellow line through the landscape. Um, I think it's one of those projects where the, the architects you were about the same as the construction fee. Um, a small little prefabricated concrete stair. Um, and we didn't even um, design this because this is a standardized key clamp system uh, that you can buy anywhere in the world. The only thing we did was to choose the color. Um, of course, the local kids, they have understood how to use this. Uh, but the color we got from the local seagull. And we're pretty proud of this fact that we twice have managed to get the, the word um, uh, beak yellow, the, 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 the mouth of the, the bird, on the front page of the local newspaper in Lofoten. Um, part of what it constitutes to be Nordic is it the seasons. Uh, this is a building we did at Svalbard. Um, Svalbard is at 78 degrees north which means that there's four months of total darkness. Or not total darkness, this is sort of the way it is when your eyes get adjusted to, to darkness and the, the ground is covered with snow. Uh, this is the administration building for the governor. Um, another painting by Solberg of Röros, a uh, mining town covered in snow. Um, which says something about the condition of winter. But then again, we have the opposite. We have the summers. When there's four months of total darkness, it also means at Svalbard that there's four months of total daylight. The sun does not go down. Um, and this flower field somewhere uh, with something that could be a moon or could be the midnight sun uh, says something about this, this amazing condition during the summer. Um, the celebration of Midsummer's Eve, another painter, uh, Astrup, or Edvard Munch, the way he depicts the moon's um, uh, reflection in the Oslo Fjord. Uh, this sort of condition of two completely different lives can be reflected in many ways. In this case, it's a tourist route, uh, there's actually a, a tourist information booth uh, in Henningsvær, which is open three months of the year. It's totally closed from, for nine months of the year. So during the, 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 the tourist season, it's open like this, uh, while during the rest of the year, uh, it looks like this. Um, this is a housing complex that we did on the harbor of Oslo. And if you're very uh, sort of uh, knowledgeable, you will see that in the very right-hand corner, you can see the, the stage tower of the famous opera building done by Snoheta. Uh, it's impossible to sell an apartment in Oslo without a balcony. That's not because of the wonderful climate we have, but quite the opposite. Um, you need to have the balcony to think about during the whole year, when you, every day, you, you look out on your balcony and you think about those few wonderful times you had it during summer. Uh, 
Uh, light, yes, this situation, um, the weather situation and the changing seasons give a particular uh, quality of light. Sverifan, uh, who was my teacher and that I also had the chance to teach with for the last two years of his teaching uh, uh, period, did the Nordic Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, built the year I was, completed the year I was born, 1962, uh, where he tried to recreate the, the Nordic light, the shadowless light of, a, uh, of, a, of an area that was covered in clouds uh, through this roof structure, where there are no shadows at all. Uh, but it's not always like that. In the summer times, we have this quite amazing, strong, strong sunlight that is almost too much. Uh, another painter, Kavli, which managed to, to, to capture that through his paintings. Or again, uh, the summer nights, again, the painter Solberg showing the view from his balcony. And uh, this is the view from my balcony taken at 11 o'clock at night on Midsummer's Eve. Uh, materiality. Um, yes, that's a theme. When you're always confronted with nature, when you're sort of in, uh, when you're not sort of uh, protected by, by the man-made, uh, you tend to choose uh, materials that has a certain texture. Uh, this is um, a coastal control station outside of uh, Stavanger, which means that uh, Stavanger is the main oil hub of Norway, and they control from this little building, they control the ship's traffic uh, all around the area of Stavanger. The building itself is clad with slate, uh, referring to the traditional use of slate for all the roofs in the area. The interior is all clad in the clear varnish MDF, uh, a reminiscence of the interiors of old, uh, old boats. Um, again, back to Svalbard. Um, the Svalbard University building, the UNIS building, all clad in copper, um, but done in a way where the copper itself manages to catch the snow. Um, there's not very much snow on Svalbard, but it blows back and forth. And uh, our attempt in this case was to sort of make the building uh, at one with nature uh, through actually um, catching the snow. The interior of this building is, is this sort of cave-like structure, uh, all made out of wood. Like here, um, a one-family house we did on a farm, and we usually like to call this the farmhouse. Um, as part of the construction, we had to tear down half of an old barn. Uh, and this barn was clad with 150-year-old wooden cladding that was in perfect condition. Uh, as you might know, the worst thing you can do with wood is to paint it, to try to protect it. It's much better to leave it the way it is. Um, and this cladding, not only was it sort of totally untreated, but it was also tapered because trees are tapered. So we used the geometry of the cladding to adjust to the slope of the land and the slope of the roof. The interior of this building is all clad in, in uh, pine plywood. Um, the triangle house on a triangle site, uh, all tri treated with, in a traditional way of treating wood uh, with iron sulfate which basically kills the outer layer of, uh, of the wood. It's kind of almost like a burning process um, to protect it. Interior, in this case, all clad with OSB panels, clear varnished. Well, like here, um, a cabin on the coast, um, cladded with oiled oak. Uh, 
doing these things, it's for us is always important to sort of to try this, try to use the very specific language of architecture to to tell uh, a why as a, as wide story as possible. In this case, the woman that wanted this cabin, she confessed to us during our first meetings that she she is really afraid of spiders, uh, and that became sort of a theme for this old building. We don't know if it works, but the building is all floating above ground. Uh, we don't know what, if the spiders, what they think about this sink cladding at the bottom. Uh, but there's a whole set of, of, of references to things that deals with Norwegian coast, with Norwegian summers, uh, with Norwegian boat building. If you're my age, um, you would notice that this, both the section of this building, but also this wine-painted cladding is a reference, or is exactly the same as was used on the, a set of prefabricated ice cream kiosks that were scattered all over Norway during the early 1960s. Or is it pure loneliness? I remember I was once in uh, giving a lecture in France and this old architect came up to me afterwards and, and asked um, why do you place all your buildings alone? Why don't you put them together uh, in a village like we do? And I couldn't give him a very good answer. Uh, this is a little community building um, in the Lofoten area. Uh, it's totally alone. Uh, part of that is because it serves two communities and the only way they could agree on where to put it was to put it right in between the two settlements. It's a small building that is built by the community themselves. We have this word dugnad, which doesn't have any reference in the English language, uh, which means that the the, uh, the locals, after being done with work and after had their dinner, they went to the building site and spent some few hours every day to complete this building. It's done with the humblest of materials. It's actually the cheapest way to build, to use this corrugated fiber cement. Um, the floor plan, again, very simple, a simple rectangular uh, shape and some skewed walls. All clad with fiber cement. And all wrapped in wood on the inside. And in some ways, uh, architecture has that wonderful dual nature of being, having the ability to both blend in with nature, but also to be sort of in contrast to. It can do that at the same time, as opposed to sort of an oral language that, that needs to be either or. Architecture can be both. Um, even more remote, with a site like this in northern Norway, on the top of a mountain, um, close to a famous spot with these two mountains next to each other um, called the, the Ox Mountains because like an ox. Uh, taken during construction. Um, it's extremely remote. It takes you four hours to walk from the closest place to park up here. Um, and uh, there's a helicopter hanging above this picture when they were doing the foundation work. This is the final building. Uh, again, this dual nature of both blending in and being in contrast to. Uh, obviously, the two uh, roof chimneys referring to the two mountains. Um, again, a building that wants to you to be both inside but also outside or being part of the big landscape space. Uh, most of the time it looks like this because it's winter uh, probably at least eight months of the year up there. A very compact plan where you can adjust it to if you're too 
five, 10, or 30 people, and you don't want to heat up more than what is necessary. Interior, which is sort of partly, still partly being outside before you enter into the small sleeping cabins. Kitchen area. And during the winter time, it can also look like this, or you can look at like this. Uh, we have done some things outside of Norway, and uh, even though we think that our approach uh, deals with sort of finding a local character. Uh, people tell us that, oh, this looks very Norwegian, uh, even though it's in England. This is the site in Suffolk, a strangely the place called Thorpness that was developed during the last part of the uh, 19th century and early part of the 20th century. Um, and um, our client, an organization calling themselves Living Architecture that has the intention to promote good modern architecture for the general public in England. Uh, they acquired this house um, and asked us to do a proposal. It was, uh, it was a competition, an invited competition. Um, we were also told that the local preservation board, uh, as always in England, uh, was very difficult to deal with. So we proposed to do this. Uh, or shown in a different way to do this. Uh, the site is gravel, which means that um, you can easily form it into whatever shape you want. Uh, it's also very, very windy. And the program was to provide this almost like a very small bed and breakfast. Um, so our thought was to do, um, well, first prepare the landscape, and then do sleeping cabins almost hanging in the air. Um, so the ground floor, uh, totally open, and the second floor done in a completely different way, uh, completely different geometry. Four bathrooms, no, four bedrooms, four bathrooms, a small library. Um, this building kind of leads me into a second theme of what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, it's all done with cross-laminated timber uh, and a complex shape like this uh, is very difficult, would have been very difficult to do in a traditional way through traditional uh, construction methods just to explain to the carpenter how to make shapes like this uh, would require an enormous amount of drawings uh, but by doing a 3D technology and CNC milled cross-laminated timber members, uh, we could do that in a fairly easy way. So here's the final result. Uh, we did pass the preservation board with applause. Um, so partly sunken areas to protect you from the wind. The totally open ground floor, the sunken fire pit, the kitchen counter, one of the bathrooms, and you see the inside of the cross-laminated timber. And the view from the beds. And seen at night. Um, we do have some challenges in Norway, um, or in Scandinavia in general, but specifically Norway, because our our wage level, our cost level is enormous. It costs more to produce one square meter of buildings in Norway than most places in the world. Um, we were asked by um, Louisiana, the museum outside of Copenhagen, to, to do a pavilion, which, by the way, was where I met um, Studio Granda the first time. Um, they also did the pavilion. Um, and we did so by long discussions about how do you, how do you sort of uh, convey or represent the sense of place in a white cube gallery. Uh, we made this labyrinth out of logs. 
lug construction is a traditional sort of pan-European or maybe is, is more more Europe. Uh, but we kind of stick to the lug construction for very long. Um, but the lug construction today is something completely different because it's all CNC milled. Uh, it's literally untouched by human hand. Um, so prefabrication, uh, the, the reward of thinking about advanced construction is very working in a high cost society. Uh, I've tried to discuss prefabrication with Americans and they're totally un uninterested because they're paying uh, workers five dollars uh, an hour on the building site. So they don't need to think about prefabrication. Uh, so the kit of parts of this looks like this. Um, a repetition, CNC milled, uh, rapid construction. And this is an experience. Uh, as part of this discussion, we uh, did the log house. These are traditional log houses uh, from the deep valleys of Norway. Uh, and this is a modern log house um, during construction. I mean, the log, log construction is kind of the most primitive construction you can imagine. It's sort of a, a tree and a man with an ax. It's sort of a very basic confrontation between man and nature. Uh, today, of course, all of these very complex joints are CNC milled. Um, the somewhat funny thing about this is that you can also get milled all the tubes for your electrical wires through all these logs. Uh, so the, the building itself became this sort of interplay between the sort of predefined spaces defined by the structure itself and the open spaces. Um, a building like this is about 20 centimeters taller in the summer than in the winter time because of humidity, because wood uh, expands and contracts uh, with humidity. Uh, that's also the reason why the windows are lying on the outside of the wall. So they have flexible joints. Um, and you can even see, you see this little steel column on the, on the right hand side? That is adjustable in height. So the owner of this house, he goes several times of the year and he adjusts the, the length of the column to, to fit the humidity of the, of the wood. The open kitchen. We wanted to have the glass as, as one pane, but uh, because of local zoning requirements, that windows could not have more than a specific size each, we had to divide the large windows into smaller panels. Uh, this again has led us into thinking prefabrication in terms of, of cabin making. Uh, again, a traditional log house. Uh, sort of 16th, 17th century Norwegian architecture. Um, these structures, they, in some ways, they do, some, do have something in common with very modern things like the Farnsworth House by Mies van der Rohe or Jönnötsson's own house that he designed and built uh, outside of Copenhagen before he won the competition for the, uh, the Opera House in Sydney. Uh, so we were very concerned about the expression of these cabins and this is a rendering that we did before uh, during the process of development of this. And this is the final result. So we were kind of happy that we were close. Um, this system uh, it's very simple. You can get it as long as you want, in a way. And uh, you can see one uh, version of this um, here. Um, all of these members is kind of the thinking of IKEA in a way that all the members of all the wooden members come prefabricated to the site, and the, the carpenter he shows up with a with a nail gun and a leveler. It doesn't need any any container for waste doesn't need a saw, 
So it's all assembled in a very rapid way, and the cost of this is around two-thirds of traditional construction of, of one-off architecturally designed cabins. Um, what we think is kind of nice is the fact that we, through these methods, can achieve a much higher level of precision uh, than you usually do by, uh, by, by craft work. Um, there's, there's a very simple uh, scissor truss, um, the cheapest way of spanning from A to B. Uh, at the very end, I'm just going to show you this more like, uh, I don't know how it really fits into this, but the project that we're working on right now um, in Utah, uh, a ski resort in Utah, uh, where this is actually the view from the site. This is also the view from the site. Uh, and you can see uh, what eventually will become uh, a village on the top of a mountain at 2,000 meters height. Uh, the two structures with the sort of rusted color roofs, uh, the, those are two townhouse projects that we did. Um, looking like this, uh, or like this, or maybe like this, uh, from the back side, a section through a space. Um, These are now the, the last sort of marketing images. Um, and this is from the building site taken last Tuesday. That was it. Thank you.